The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, it's Tracy here from Alpha Plus, and I'm just recording the blended learning webinar that uh, was presented on March 13th. Um, I uh, lost the recording, so I'm re-recording it. Um, I'm Tracy, and I'm a literacy practitioner who works at Alpha Plus as an organizational development consultant, and um, I've been interested in digital technology for many years now, um, especially all the great aha moments it's given me over the years. Um, Alpha Plus staff have been working with Audrey Gardner on a paper that describes uh, blended learning and literacy uh, in literacy and basic skills. We've been looking at research and what academics have to say about it, what uh, other educators are doing, what um, literacy practitioners in other jurisdictions are doing, and what we are doing here in Ontario. The idea behind this project is to articulate what Alpha Plus means when we talk about blended learning. We want to create a definition that reflects what we see in our work with the field in Ontario, as well as what we can learn from work in other places. Uh, the paper's not ready yet, um, but we're going to share some of the things we've been talking about. Um, and uh, as I would have said in the original, uh, this will be posted online and uh, um, uh, the links will be available. So we we'll start out with the basic question, what is blended learning? And we find that there are probably just as many definitions as there are practitioners um, and, but at its most fundamental, blended learning combines face-to-face -face instruction in a bricks-and-mortar space with technology-mediated instruction. The technology is often a computer with an internet connection, but it can include cell phones, tablets, video conferencing software, smart boards, and other emerging electronic devices that can connect to the internet. Blended learning uh, blends traditional ways of learning with newer knowledge spaces, but how does this happen? And what are some of the ways we integrate technology into teaching and learning? Um, one of our questions uh, when we're thinking about the paper is, do we define blended learning as an approach to program design or as a methodology that is suitable for certain lessons and activities? We're sort of leaning to the first definition um, it, in our work so far. Some people use the SAMR framework uh, when they're thinking about uh, integrating uh, technology into education. Um, you can see um, each one of these um, uh, sections in the framework um, spell out the word SAMR, <laughs> which isn't a word, obviously. Um, so we start with substitution and move through augmentation, augmentation uh, modification and redefinition. In uh, whoops, I went too far. Um, in the substitution, whoops, why is it doing that to me? In substitution, uh, where technology acts as a direct substitute, there's no real change in um, in what we're doing in terms of teaching and learning. We're just substituting technology for another or a newer technology for an older technology. So for example, technology now allows us to substitute a word processor for a typewriter or for pen and paper. Um, and we can create and print quizzes for learners. So we can use our computers to make quizzes, but there's no real change in what we're doing. We're just using a different technology. In terms of augmentation, um, there is some fu uh, functional improvement when we, when we use a different technology. So, um, so when we use a word processor, for example, we can use spell check or a thesaurus, which makes things a little bit easier for us. Uh, we can use copy and paste. Um, we don't have to retype things or use whiteout, those kind of things. So there's some functional improvement in what we're doing when we change technology. And um, in teaching, for example, we can use online quizzes which may allow for immediate feedback and assessment, which uh, is good for the students and allows us to keep records of student progress in a different way. In modification, um, in that um, uh, mode, 
Um, the technology is now allowing us to redesign tasks by using um, tech, a different kind of technology. So now we have technology that allows students to collaborate on the same document using a wiki or Google Docs or OneDrive um, easily rather than having to have um, different versions and passing a document around. Everybody can edit the same document. Oops. Sorry, wrong slide there. Okay, and in redefinition, um, in this way, uh, this is when technology, a new technology, will allow us to redefine uh, the task completely and to do things that were, before this technology, were inconceivable. So, um, uh, so an example of that might be that where we used to use tech, text documents, we can now use videos or create a website instead. Um, the people who, um, oops, hello, sorry, I'm having slide control trouble. Okay. Um, people who, um, Dr. Puente Tara Dura, who proposed this, um, SAMR framework, um, also proposes that curriculum becomes more learner centered and more learner driven as we move from substitution through to redefinition. In his view, technology allows for presentations to authentic audiences in the same space uh, as the learners or online, more immediate feedback, more possibilities for collaboration, more possibilities for differentiated learning opportunities. And the use of technology can increase learner confidence, engagement, and motivation. It encourages learners to be critical thinkers and self-directed. So in his view, the technology is actually um, what allows for this to happen rather than methodologies that um, teachers are using. Uh, one of the questions we are having looking at SAMR is, are substitution and augmentation, are those blended learning or does the use of technology have to transform learning in order to be uh, considered to be uh, blended learning? Another framework um, is this uh, TPAC framework in this diagram, it looks quite complicated. But what it tries to show is um, that how we integrate our knowledge of content, of pedagogy, and of technology to create a uh, curriculum. So in, in this case, technology is not the only uh, driver of, um, of change in the, in the, in the way um, um, learning is happening. So in, the, in this diagram, you can see TK, which is technical knowledge, and that represents a teacher's knowledge about working with technology. So their understanding of information technology um, uh, and being able to apply it productively at work and in everyday life and being able to recognize when information technology can insist or act as a barrier to the ch achievement of a goal and being able to continually adapt to changes in information technology. Um, PK, which is the pedagogical knowledge, represents uh, teachers how they understand uh, developing uh, pedagogy, understanding how students learn, understanding things about classroom management and group building, lesson planning, assessment, all those kind of things that go into what we think about uh, when we think about teaching. And CK is the content knowledge, which represents teachers' knowledge of the subject matter um, that students want to learn. So then we have these, uh, in the Venn diagram, we have these little spaces in between uh, where the circles start to overlap. And TPK is where techno technological knowledge is aligned with pedagogical knowledge understanding how teaching and learning can change when particular technologies are used in particular ways. Um, TCK is uh, where uh, techno technological knowledge and uh, content knowledge are aligned. So understanding which technologies are best suited for different subject matter learning. And PCK is pedagogical knowledge and how that's aligned with content knowledge. So understanding which methodologies and approach, approaches are suited for different uh, subject matter learning. And when we get 
put this all together in the middle, uh, where all the circles overlap, we get uh, T-Pank. And this is how we understand how to uh, represent and demonstrate con uh, concepts using t different technologies. Um, we understand pedagogical techniques that use technologies in constructive ways to teach content. Uh, we understand what makes concepts difficult or easy to learn and how technology can help um, make things easier for people to learn and help um, students overcome some of the challenges that they face when they're trying to learn new things. And we understand how technologies can be used to strengthen existing knowledge and develop new skills um, and uh, understanding in, with, in students. Um, what we find in, in the work that we've been doing is that instructors and program designers put this knowledge together in a variety of different ways. And uh, we've been looking at some of the models for digital learning and um, how they vary by teacher roles, physical space, delivery methods, and scheduling. So one model that we see um, used here in Ontario quite a lot is this hybrid model, sometimes known as a self-blend model. Um, in this model, learners take remote um, or distance online courses to supplement courses that they're taking in a bricks and mortar program. So LBS used this model uh, when they would attend a, a program and take some e-channel courses to expand their learning op opportunities. Um, some learners do all of their work, um, their LBS courses in e-channel, and do not attend a bricks and mortar program. They work remotely and they have face-to-face uh, -face check ins or synchronous class meetings using video conferencing software. Um, and this model is referred to as the online driver model. So most of the learning happens in an online environment. Okay, in some uh, LBS programs, work, uh, learners do uh, work in e-channel and or other online learning uh, environments, and it, but it's integrated into the work they're doing into the, in the bricks and mortar program where they meet with instructors um, and other learners. And in rotation models, learners rotate on a fixed schedule between some self-paced online learning and learning in a physical classroom with other, with other learners and instructors. So these are um, known as rotation models. Okay. Um, there's other models uh, where, that combine f uh, bricks and mortar space with online space. And these are the flex or online lab models. Um, in, these, in these cases, most of the curriculum is delivered through an online platform, but learners come to a program, to a bricks and mortar space to do that work. And uh, in the flex model, learners can meet with on-site instructors who either provide small group tutoring or some one-to-one -one -one support. Um, in face-to-face -face driver models, instructors deliver most of the curriculum in a bricks and mortar classroom, and they use digital technology to enhance and enrich the learning experience. A variation of this is called the flipped classroom. In flipped classrooms, uh, the sort of traditional um, division of how we uh, deliver um, teaching is, is flipped. So in a traditional a delivery mode, uh, instructors sort of take on this sage on the stage role, it's called sometimes. Uh, learners read and watch and absorb learning material in class and then practice individually, often at home. So, um, you know, they might be attending a lecture or the, some kind of presentation or demonstration that instructors do in a classroom and then they're, they're given homework. In the flipped environment, uh, instructors prepare lectures and presentations, but they do it through video or audio or some other kind of way. And, and uh, students um, watch those presentations at home or on their own time. And the time in classroom is spent working through the concepts. Um, and the, in the classroom, the teacher acts more as a guide on the side rather than the uh, sage on the stage role. Um, and often these classrooms come with a, some online platform where learners and instructors 
are having discussions or collaborating on documents or um, creating um, some kind of artifact from uh, the learning that they're doing. Uh, in LBS, we don't often, or we don't always divide learning into classroom work and homework. Um, in, especially in community-based programs, people don't always send students home to do work. Most of the work is happening in the classroom. But in a flipped LBS classroom might be one where uh, learners use the internet to do independent or group research on a topic and practice new skills or apply new knowledge by working through it individually or in groups supported by an instructor or um, other learners in the program. Uh, blended uh, project-based learning is similar to the LBS flipped classroom model, but uh, the outcome is a little bit different. In this case, learners use uh, both online learning, uh, either in the form of courses or some kind of self-directed access or research that they might be doing, and face-to-face -face instruction to learn about a topic. They collaborate to research, design, and publish project-based learning assignments products and related artifacts. So in project-based learning, um, the, the class works on a project and they create something at the end. So um, in LBS, um, sometimes we do things like create a, 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 a newsletter or a magazine of student writing um, in the program, something like that. That would be uh, project-based learning. Many definitions of blended learning include the concept of connectivism, and this is the idea that learning happens in networks. Um, network learning uses a mix of technologies and interactions to create learning environments where learners are actively involved in the learning process and are encouraged to construct their own understandings and knowledge. Um, connectivism means expanding learning circles beyond the bricks and mortar classroom. So in, in connectivism, the idea is that we learn through other people. So anybody who's experienced any kind of crowdsourcing of knowledge, um, uh, you know, even something simple as going on Facebook and asking for recommendations about uh, tradespeople or where to find a good meal in a new city, those kind of things, that's a, an example of connected learning where we're using our networks to, um, to learn new things. As learners, we make meaning by understanding how ideas and concepts are connected, and we diversify our knowledge by developing learning networks. Um, we strengthen learning when we can connect our knowledge to the new things we are learning and can express our ideas in networks. And this is the idea that um, if you learn something and you never talk to anybody about it, um, you know, how deep is that learning? Uh, Etienne Wenger is uh, 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 somebody who wrote a lot about communities of practice, and he says, we are essentially social beings. We live in societies, of course, but more fundamentally, perhaps, it is our participation in social communities and cultural practices that provides the very materials out of which we construct who we are, give meaning to what we do, and understand what we know. And George Siemens, who's... Uh, a connectivism founder um, put it this way we cannot stop the desire to know the desire to know is balanced with our desire to communicate to share to connect and our desire to make sense to understand to know the meaning um, new technologies and new ways of using technology bring disruption we know this um, we're in an age of disruption that probably started with the invention of the World Wide Web in 1989, 29 years ago now. Um, many people compare this era to the Industrial Revolution that occurred over the 60 years from 1760 until 1820. So um, if our uh, disruption lasts that long, we're only halfway through. Um, so what has this disruption meant for learning? Um, Jane Hart wrote a nice blog post uh, in March of 2015 called Learners Are Learning Differently and Are You Changing the Way You Train and Support Them? Unfortunately, this article is no longer available online. She's put it into a book. Um, so now you have to 
if you want to read it, you have to buy her book. But uh, basically, um, her points are that learning today is on demand. So people want to learn things. Um, they don't want to wait. They want to learn things when they need to learn things. That it happens in short bursts. Um, she's talking in, in her article a lot about how we learn as, as workers in our workplaces. Um, but that we tend to, um, you know, we need to know something. And so we um, take on learning for a short period of time. It's social. So, um, which is, and which is uh, another way of saying connected. It happens in networks. Um, it happens in the flow or of work or on the go. So people don't, sometimes don't set aside, okay, this is my learning time. They just sort of do it as they're, as they're working. It's often serendipitous. So people are learning uh, in unexpected ways, unexpected places and at unexpected times. And most importantly, she says, it's autonomous. So people are in control of their own learning, um, uh, where they learn, when they learn, what they learn, um, how they learn it those kind of things, and that people more and more are expecting that kind of learning environment. So what is this uh, disruption meant for teaching? Um, for teaching, there's sort of a move to opening up learning and making it more accessible and flexible, um, and that bricks and mortar, like bricks and mortar classroom is no longer the sort of unique center of learning. People are, are finding lots of other spaces um, to learn without coming to a classroom or to a program. And in some ways, the instructor role is changing. There's much more negotiation over content and methods and a focus on developing and supporting learner autonomy. So in many ways, we find that what we're doing is preparing people for um, to be flexible in terms of learning environments and, and to be an autonomous learner because it's um, very much expected of people um, in the community and, and at work. Um, one uh, Ontario literacy practitioner that I was talking to put it this way, in traditional methods, the instructor le lectures, assigns work, and assesses learners. In today's world, and in literacy to some extent, this has changed. Technology offers more information than an instructor can have. The instructor's role is to lead students to access that information. The instructor is a facilitator that presents learners with options and gets feedback about how those options are working. The instructor is a learning expert and a tech support, like a tech support who specializes in learning, a guide on the side. So that's a, a term that we've seen before. On the student side, um, it can mean an emphasis on learners supporting each other through social media, peer assessment, and discussion groups. Um, it can sometimes be hard. The student autonomy piece can sort of be difficult for students, um, uh, for some students, not for all of them, but um, some people find that sort of taking control of their own learning. It can be quite challenging. And the time management pieces and the um, um, decision-making pieces can be challenging. I think for all of us, uh, I know that I've been in online courses and forgotten that I was taking them and suddenly remembered at the end of the week, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be doing some coursework now. Um, in, in looking at what this disruption is meant for educators, uh, Jane Hart sort of presents this binary from her research. Um, and on the one side, you have people who are thinking, I want to change things. I'm continuously engaging in informal learning, immersing myself in what other people are talking about, looking for sounding boards, taking risks, and offering, opting for a more intuitive approach. And at the other side, um, uh, we have people who are thinking more in a mode of, I want to catch up. I prefer to play it safe, wait for other people to try things and copy what works. I take a more traditional approach to my own learning, choosing to attend conferences and read papers for ideas. So um, our experience in talking to people in the field and uh, doing this research is that rather than a binary, that this is more of a continuum or when it is a binary um, that people might feel one way one day and uh, the, 
totally opposite way another day, depending on other things that are going on at work or in their life or uh, other um, opportunities or challenges that uh, are coming up. Um, and so uh, another question we have is, uh, what has this dis oops, truck going by, sorry. What has this disruption meant for LBS and li literacy practitioners? In our conversations, uh, Audrey Gardner, who's um, uh, actually writing the paper, um, used the phrase uneasy relationship to text when she was describing how emergent readers uh, approach reading. And uh, we started to think about our uneasy relationship with technology. As literacy workers, we see so many positive ways that technology has changed things for us and for the learners we work with, but not all the changes feel positive. Um, we might some days be excited about how the technology opens up possibilities for learning, and then at other times find that some of the changes are adding to our workload or shifting what we do at work in ways that feel less positive. So, um, we have a, one of our questions was, you know, how do we help people working in programs negotiate this uneasy relationship? And uh, one thing we looked at was uh, design thinking um, to help us sort of think through this question. In design thinking, um, there are sort of uh, four steps to approaching uh, uh, creating a solution uh, to something and the, uh, First step is to define the problem. So who, what, who are we um, uh, wanting to help or support? What do they need? Why do they need it? Um, we do um, a lot of research, uh, user research. Um, we're trying to, um, you know, put ourselves in other people's shoes um, and that kind of thing. And uh, in design thinking, this is considered to be the hard part. So coming up with the uh, what is the problem? What is uh, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, but I think in LBS we have experience with this um, because many of us take on a reflective practice approach, and uh, we develop our questions based on our own curiosity about how learners are learning. Whoops. Sorry. And. Um, how they respond to different uh, strategies that we are using. So we experiment in, in our programs uh, and we talk about our questions with um, our colleagues and with uh, learners and um, you know, with experts when we can find them. Okay. The second step in, in design thinking is um, uh, sort of fancy word, ideation, but generating ideas. So learning from other sectors, other disciplines, uh, learning from each other, learning from the people we work with, either as colleagues or um, students in, a, in our programs, and, uh, and choosing ideas that have potential. So uh, promising practices, that kind of thing. And this is sort of considered the easy part. It's, it's fun to think about this. And in LBS, uh, we do this by, uh, we read, we attend webinars like this, go to conferences, talk with our colleagues, and uh, we do a lot of strategic brainstorming in, uh, in our work. Um, uh, lots of people have experience with this and they do it quite skillfully. Um, in uh, the next, uh, Sorry. The next step in, in uh, design thinking is to pilot something, to test it, um, to experiment with it and to refine it and experiment again. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as the scary part um, because we're putting our ideas into action and uh, it can be a bit scary. Uh, it's definitely a process that we're used to in LBS. Um, but uh, choosing and implementing, evaluating and revising methodologies um, can be very challenging. We need to be prepared to fail or partly fail. And um, uh, ideas that are still in our head are still great ideas because they're still all beautifully laid out somewhere. It's when we try to turn the ideas into practice that things can get messy. And uh, we need to be prepared for that mess, and we need space to experiment, to explore, to adjust our thinking and our practice as we deepen our knowledge and experience. And uh, many people 
in L working in LBS um, express that this is what they're missing, the time and the space to, to do this kind of experimentation and exploration. Um, and in some cases it's an LBS, problems and solutions have been identified for us and we're asked to do the implementation, which is the scary part. Um, and uh, sometimes we find we don't have the right level of support for the implementation. And sometimes we have, we might have a different idea about what the actual problem is and therefore what the solution would be. And uh, this adds to the challenge of implementing something new and it can make us feel resent resistant to that and to the next new thing uh, that comes along. Um, we've sort of been asking ourselves in, at Alpha Plus about our role in this equation and how are we supporting programs and all of the steps of design thinking and how can we support programs better in the hard parts and the scary parts. Um, sometimes we've been talking about how, you know, sometimes in the coaching program, we sort of help people come up with ideas and then we sort of leave them with the implementation and maybe there's a way we could support programs better um, through that. Uh, the last step in, in design thinking is reflection and evaluation and uh, analyzing what's, what's happened and planning the next steps. And again, this is something that LBS prac practitioners are skilled at and have a lot of experience um, uh, doing strategic thinking and, uh, and uh, developing continuous improvement processes for our programs. But again, we need time and space and support and if we're going to engage in making changes, we want to be sure that uh, it's worth our investment of that time and that energy. Okay, so just to um, finish up here, um, I'm going to talk about some of the benefits that um, the research tells us um, come with blended learning. So, um, uh, one of the things that a blended learning approach gives us is uh, it's that it's based on the adult learning principle of learner-centered education and it aligns strongly with the historical and current predominant adult learning principle in adult literacy education. So in some ways we don't, it doesn't disrupt, there's a piece of the work that we do that is not disrupted by blended learning. Um, oops. Um, the focus of blended learning is the, is the learner, not the technology. It's collaborative by design and uh, creates learning opportunities that are non-linear, creative, social, and self-directed. And uh, by this we mean that um, in blended learning we're focusing on the learning experience um, and we're using technology where it helps not, uh, we're not being driven by the technology. Our decisions aren't driven by, you know, wanting to use new technology. It's driven by what uh, works best for learners. Um, a blended learning design increases the potential for learners to continue to practice their digital technology skills and knowledge uh, when they're not in literacy programs. Uh, many learners step in and step out of programs over time with more programs using blended learning design in the uh, the potential for adults to use online technologies in their personal, social, and work life increases and uh, self-directed learning increases when adults have gained problem-solving skills and experience critical and creative thinking in group interactions in blended learning designed adult literacy programs. So we can see that one of the benefits is for um, probably all of us, but learners who do step in and step out of programs to be able to continue their learning um, when they're not in a program and to be able to easily step back in. In blended learning design programs and courses, skills and knowledge development is facilitated through a diversity of environments where reading, writing and numeracy skill development occurs when learners engage in critical reflection. Um, critical thinking, creativity, curiosity, collaboration, and problem solving. So while learners are learning the reading and writing skills and numeracy skills, they're also developing a sort of 21st century skills and knowledge um, at the same time. 
Um, and one of the other benefits that I see um, is our network. Um, so technology um, increases and enriches our ability to develop a community of practice. Um, we're often uh, at quite a distance from each other um, and our, our opportunities to speak to each other are rare. Um, there aren't a lot of conferences, there's not a lot of opportunities to be in the same place at the same time. So uh, technology helps us with that. Um, so this is sort of where we're at now in our thinking and our research and uh, we'll keep you informed as our ideas come together into a paper and uh, when the paper's ready we'll definitely be sharing that uh, with the field. Uh, one of the questions we hear a lot is what are other people doing? And I uh, just wanted to point out that uh, there was the online community of practice series uh, delivered through eChannel, uh, where we learned a lot about how people are using eChannel and blended learning str uh, strategies. And uh, in the next year at Alpha Plus, we plan to build on that work and collaborate with uh, programs in Ontario to highlight promising ways that they're integrating technology into curriculum and using uh, technology to make program coordination more efficient, streamlined. Um, we're, um, this is going to be our last webinar for a little while. We're going to create some on-demand training uh, that programs can request when they need it. And uh, Maria and I are working on a Google Classroom to help people learn more about Google Classroom in the Google Classroom. So uh, uh, that's something to look forward to. Um, and uh, we're working on a lot on um, uh, understanding how we leave our digital footprints and uh, looking at privacy solutions to help programs develop privacy guidelines and where we're um, and uh, and uh, we're also uh, developing an online classroom comparison chart to help programs choose an LMS. So that's some of the stuff uh, you can look forward to in the next year from from Alpha Plus. So I just want to thank everybody who attended the webinar and for anybody who's listening now. And uh, you'll see at the end here, there's some resources. So you can, uh, there'll be a link below um, where you can uh, uh, get access to the PDF and take a look at these um, resources. Okay, thanks everybody.